Take your Bibles, you see they're up on the screen, Romans 8, if you would. Um, I was, um, believe it, <laughs> this is how this happened. I uh, was praying about uh, what to preach today, and um, what I, th I thought about doing was preaching uh, on our mind and how it is that we think certain ways, think certain things. Uh, if you've ever had ideas pop in your head, if they were good ideas, or if, if uh, let's say, you were talking to somebody about the Lord, or you were just talking to somebody in general, and the Holy Ghost then uh, will uh, move in you, He'll not force you. You have a free will. This is something that God put in us that he didn't put in animals, um, but he put in us a free will. And the Holy Spirit, you know, Jesus promised this, that when we're talking and witnessing to somebody, um, you know, think not about what you're going to say for the Holy Spirit will give you the words to speak that they will not be able to gain, say, nor resist. And uh, so I was thinking about all of that and about, how the, the human mind works and how it is that some people believe in God and some people don't. And why is that? Uh, why is it that uh, some who say they believe in God and they believe in Jesus Christ, um, they don't believe in him the way the Bible says? Uh, for instance, uh, there are those who the commandments clearly, and not just the Ten Commandments, all through the Old Testament, the biggest sin that Israel constantly committed was they were going after other gods and they were praying to statues, stone idols, golden covered idols, idols made out of wood. God even made an illustration he said the, the axeman goes out, cuts down a tree, and he takes part of the tree, and he uses his tools on it, and he fashions an idol, and he prays to it, and he doesn't think that the rest, he doesn't think about the fact that the rest of the tree, part of it went into the oven to bake his bread, part of it went into the fireplace to keep his house warm, and it's the same tree. What is it about this part of the tree that, you know, causes him to pray to it while the rest of the tree gets burned up in the fireplace. And uh, so you, it makes you wonder why some people still think that way after God clearly, all through the Bible, says, don't do this. But people still do it. And they believe that they are following God in that. But God said no. And so I was thinking about that. And I had the idea, you know, to see... Uh, what I preached last Sunday, um, which was what? What did I preach last Sunday? I don't remember either. But I pulled up the notes, and it was about reconciliation. And the main verse that I used was Romans 8, 5 through 8. And I thought, I wonder if there's anything in this verse that I used last Sunday that has to do with the operation of the mind. Let's read it. Romans 8, 5. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. When you mind it, what does that mean? You pay attention with your mind. That's where your mind is focused. On the things of the flesh. But they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. They mind the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death. But to be spiritually minded, and so I had my answer that what I, the verse that I used last Sunday led right into and had everything to do with the operation of our minds. And advice, not just advice, a warning and a commandment. 
because the uh, carnal mind is enmity against God. That was one of the words we focused on last Sunday, enmity, warfare. You're at a battle with God and your carnal mind is the one fighting the battle. You don't fight a battle with God with your, with your fist. You don't do karate kicks in the air. You don't use a, uh, what is that little doll they put pins in? A voodoo doll. You don't do that with God. When you battle God, you do it in your mind. The Holy Ghost is trying to say something to you and you're fighting against it. The Holy Ghost, I've, as a preacher, I've seen people for years during an invitation to come and make things right with God at the end of a service, I've seen people fight God during that whole time, knowing they were under conviction. You could see it. They were holding on to that pew. Their knuckles were turning white. They were holding on so tight. Couldn't wait to get out of that service. The carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God. Your mind will not ever talk you into serving God. Or a carnal mind won't. A carnal mind always wants to break God's commandments. What are some of those commandments? Thou shalt not covet. Coveting is 100% a sin that's performed in your mind. You can't, and you can hide it from people. You can covet and lust after things and nobody sees you doing it. Because nobody can see the operation of your mind. That's something you learn in, in legal, uh, legal proceedings is that a person is not allowed to testify what somebody else knew or what somebody else thought or what somebody else intended to do. You can't get in a court of law on the witness stand and say, I know they did it because I know them and they would have done this. You can't say that because you don't know the operation of somebody's mind. So when it comes to coveting, you can covet after all kinds of things. During the day, when you lay your head down at night, your mind can wander on all the things you want to do or all the things you want to be part of or what, all the sins you want to commit and nobody would ever know because they're all right here. But yet, God knows. In fact, I've got verses here that will prove to you that God does know everything you think. It's not a mystery to him. The carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. Now, this is a long sermon. So at about quarter after 12, we're going to have some people come and pass out food and water for everybody. <laughs> no, we're not going to do that. You're going to have to go get your own. Uh, and so I will be continuing this next Sunday and maybe the Sunday after that. We'll see. Um, but I enjoyed the study. I, I learned some things. And so I don't know that I've ever really preached a message on our thoughts, where they come from, uh, and how to deal with them when those thoughts are wrong or how to judge them when those thoughts may be right and we want to make sure that God favors what we're thinking. Okay, how many of you would like to hear some sermons on that? Say amen, raise your hand. Okay. Um, you, can, you can read Joel Osteen's book. Uh, your best life now. And he will say things like, if you will change your thoughts, God will change your life. And yet, how easy is it to stop thinking about certain things? If I say, don't think of a pink elephant, 
What'd you do? I told you not to. That's the first thing you did. Jesus also said, you know, these people like Joel Osteen, Joyce Myers, David Crank. If I was in the ministry, I'd change my name. I am in the ministry. But anyway, they say things like, if you think positive thoughts and say positive things, then positive things will happen. They will come to pass. They will, they will appear before your eyes. It's called the power of positive thinking. It's called the, uh, the law of attraction in witchcraft. Yes, it is witchcraft. It's called word faith in their, in their movement. But Jesus said, which one of you, just by thinking, can add a cubit to your stature? And the answer is, nobody. It doesn't work that way. You can't just think good things all the time and say positive things all the time and then expect that the whole universe is going to bow down before your thoughts and your words. It doesn't. Now, when God says something, it happens. But when I say something, I listen, I've been preaching for years. And people don't usually do everything I say that they ought to do. So I know it doesn't work. So we'll, we'll explore all of these as we move along. Let's pray. Father, we ask your blessings uh, upon your word. I pray, dear God, that what is said today uh, would come from heaven's throne and not my own mind, not my own thoughts, certainly not out of my flesh. I pray, Heavenly Father, that you would uh, give us understanding, that you would give us uh, knowledge, and through that knowledge and through that understanding, Father, give us wisdom on how to live. Father, all of us are guilty of the wrong thoughts, the wrong decisions, of committing sins that always started out in the mind. Father, we're always all guilty of that. I pray, dear God, that you would have mercy on us and, Lord, that you would show us from your word how to deal with where these thoughts are going to come from, how the enemy will use them against us to destroy us or destroy our testimony or destroy your word in our hearts. So, Father, give us wisdom, give us understanding, bless us, Father, and help us, dear God, then uh, to take the things that you have taught us today. Lord, would you apply them in our lives so that we can grow, that we can mature, and then we can share with others the wonderful things from your word that we've learned. Bless us today, we pray in Jesus' name, and all of God's people said, Amen. Now. God does know your thoughts. Ezekiel 11, verse 5. The Spirit of the Lord fell upon me and said unto me, Speak, thus saith the Lord, thus have ye said, O house of Israel. God says, For I know the things that come into your mind, every one of them. So, is there a thought then, and if you're taking notes, take notes. If you're taking notes, take notes. You could write down, the Bible says, God knows every thought. There's nothing that goes on in our mind that we can hide from God. Jonah was an idiot. Thinking that he could go to a place and hide from God. He didn't realize that just the very thought of where he was going to go to hide from God. God already knew where he was going and he was there already. God had it prepared. God had the great fish prepared. God had the men on the ship prepared. God brought the storm along that caused them to throw Jonah overboard. God had it all in his power. He was working that whole scenario out because God knew that Jonah was going to run from God. He knew where he was going to run to. He knew it before Jonah even knew where he was going to run to. So God knows every thought. Uh, think about uh, Jesus. 
When Jesus was uh, around here on this earth, there in the Gospels, we see it all the time that the Bible says Jesus perceived their thoughts. Jesus perceived the hardness of their heart. He's the Word of God. The Bible says that the uh, Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword and is able to discern between the thoughts and the intents of the heart. God, the Word of God, when you read the Bible and the Bible just cuts you right in half and splays you out, opens you up so that you see yourself for who you really are, that was the Word of God knowing who you are. Know, how can a book know what I'm thinking? When the book was written by God, it knows. Think of, um, I used this verse in Sunday school this morning, Isaiah 14, 12. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer? How art thou cut down to the ground which didst weaken the nations? Now, one of the things we know about Satan is that he never comes out and says, this is what I'm going to do and this is my intention. This is what I'm after. So he keeps secrets. He hides it. And yet, God looks at Lucifer, Satan, and says, For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God, I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation, in the sides of the north, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds, I will be like the Most High. God knew his thoughts. The devil never said to God, God, I'm going to take your throne away. And yet, God knew it because he can discern their thoughts, or his thoughts. Psalm 94, 11. The Lord knoweth the thoughts of man that they are vanity. Vanity, it, it means um, uh, it, it, it's vain, it passes away, like beauty, like how you looked yesterday when you went to bed is not how you looked the next morning when you got up. Your beauty vanished away. That's vanity. Beauty is vanity, the Bible says. God knows our thoughts that they're vain. Nobody ever thought of something for the kingdom of God and God said, Wow, I never thought of that. That is, we, we'll do that. In fact, I'll write that in the Bible for everybody. God never... He's never impressed with what we think. Say amen. So you got two witnesses in the Bible. Both of them tell you that God knows your thoughts. He knows every single one of them. And you're not going to hide those. You can hide them from other people. You cannot say them. In fact, 90% of the time, it's best if you don't say everything that you think. Amen. Especially sometimes what you think about me while I'm preaching. Amen. Now... Let's know our enemy. Our enemy is always going to attack our mind. That's, that's why I call this the battlefield of the mind. That's the battlefield, is the mind. The devil knows if he gets the mind, he's got the heart. He's got the people. Hitler knew this, didn't he? Hitler practiced public speaking. He had a photographer take pictures of him wearing various outfits, including Lederhosen. You know what I'm talking about? The German, they wear the shorts and the suspenders and the, you know, colorful shirts and they, you know, long socks and they do the weird dancing. He even wore that. Because he wanted to see what looked the best on him, what would reach a crowd. And then he practiced doing certain poses while he's like he's speaking and he's making hand gestures. And, he, and so if you watch early speeches from Adolf Hitler, you'll see him doing these things here. He's making, he's practiced those hand gestures because he knows that those speak to the human mind more so than his words. And that's how Hitler gained so much power was his effectiveness in his public speaking. It's not that he was the brightest bulb in Germany. It's just that he had the will and the desire to rise to the top. 
He practiced ways so that he could get into people's minds. He got into their minds and he led Germany through some of the darkest days that they've ever seen. Then he went after the kids. And if this message doesn't mean a whole lot to you, learn it for your children's sake and your grandchildren's sake. Learn it. Because the devil may look at you and say, well, they're too old. I'm going to leave them alone. But I'm going after the kids. I'm going after the grandkids. I'm going after the great grandkids and I'll destroy them. And how does he destroy them? The mind. Hitler knew that. That's why he created the Hitler Youth. These young, blonde-haired, blue-eyed, Aryan German children. He was training them. They were being indoctrinated. Uh, my goodness, he was even birthing them. There were women who were nothing but birth slaves to the Third Reich that had certain types of children from certain chosen men because he believed that a master race would come out of that and if he could indoctrinate them long after he died, Nazism, National Socialism, and the Third Reich would continue on. It would be literally his thousand year reign over Germany even though he was dead. So he knew the effectiveness of reaching the mind of children. Now, let's look at our country now. They're teaching our children that it's bad to even touch a gun. They're making it so a child who speaks in sign language and has to spell his name out and his name has the letter G in it which he has to make by making this hand symbol here. And a school in the St. Louis area put this kid on detention, kicked him out for three days because he violated their, uh, their whatever they call it, their rule against guns in school because he made a gun symbol with his hand to spell his name out. They kicked him out. That's conditioning. That's brainwashing. That's why I took Michaela out in the backyard and handed her a gun and say, Shoot it! <laughs> Amen. Why is it that the sodomites want into the public schools so bad? Conditioning. Why is it that Bud Light chose to market themselves to less than 1% of the population of America by putting a transgendered person and celebrating them on a can of Bud Light in the face of all beer drinkers. All of, If you go to stores now, you'll see all the core stuff gone. And all the Budweiser stuff's still there. Nobody's buying it. But they wanted to try to condition America's rednecks into believing that transgenderism is okay, and it's not. It's all about conditioning. It's all about the mind. So, the enemy in Matthew 4, 1 Thessalonians 3, is called the tempter. That's Satan. And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. Now, again, the devil didn't make Jesus do this. The devil didn't turn the stones to bread, which I think he probably could have. He didn't turn the stones to bread and say, Jesus, why don't you eat this? Or you better eat it. He didn't do that. Jesus was hungry. He hadn't eaten for 40 days. And the tempter went to him while he was at his weakest point and offered him the opportunity to make bread. He was speaking to Jesus' mind. First Thessalonians 3, For this cause, when I could no longer forbear, I sent to know your faith, lest by some means the tempter have tempted you, and our labor be in vain. Notice this verse, that Paul is saying that with temptation, which always takes place in the mind, with temptation... It has or can have the effect 
of making the labor of God, the labor of the Holy Spirit, the labor of those who serve God in vain. Because if people can be talked into coming to church, the devil can talk them out of it. Amen? So that's one of his names is the tempter. That's the devil. Now, turn to Genesis 3. I've made a, a, a point of saying this a few times. It dawned on me what exactly the devil does and what he doesn't do. And it occurred to me that not one time did the devil ever even suggest to Eve that she eat the fruit. He never said the word, eat it, eat this fruit. He didn't say, why don't you eat it? He never even did that. What he did was, he drew a picture in her mind of what it would be like if she ate the fruit, what would happen to her afterward. And then he obviously lied. Let's read it. Genesis 3, verse 1. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field. Subtlety has to do with the operation of the mind. In other words, you're focused on something, and before you know it, someone else is standing there next to you. And you go, whoa! In the world you come from. They didn't announce their coming. They didn't stomp their feet when they came in. They just kind of sidled up to you. And scared the daylights out of you. It's one of my favorite things to do. Um, and he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden. So the first thing he did was plant the seed of doubt in Eve's mind. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand or acknowledge this, but if, have you ever questioned God's word? I have. Have you ever doubted it. Have you ever read it and say, yeah, I know that's true, but it's probably not true for me. I've done too many things bad. I've done too many things wrong. This is for God's people that he likes. This is for God's people that are holy. This is for God's people that are righteous. And so I don't think this is for me. That's the devil telling you and planting seeds of doubt in your mind. So he says, Yea, hath God said, did God really say this? I don't think he said it. Is essentially what he's saying. The second thing he does. Verse uh, 4. The serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. Now he's contradicted what God said to Adam. God, he said to Adam, Thou shalt surely die. Now the devil says, ye shall not surely die. So in Eve's mind now, the consequences for eating this fruit have been lifted. So she now thinks that if she goes ahead and eats it, she won't get in trouble for it. That's one of the devil's favorite tools, especially for a child. You won't get in trouble. Do it. Catch the tree house on fire. You won't get in trouble. Steal the candy bars. You won't get in trouble. You won't get caught. You remember that, Jerry? Yeah, he remembers. I told him that story. I didn't mention you, but I mentioned me, but uh, yeah. <laughs> Steal the candy bars. You won't get caught. Uh, jump on the bed. Mom and dad don't care. Um, all kinds of things. Take mom's money. She won't care. You won't get caught. Removing the consequences away from doing wrong. And think about it now. Think about the world we live in now. Who in this country even cares anymore about God or about the possibility that they will have to pay for the sins that they do in this life? 
People have removed God so far out of their mind that they have convinced themselves or the devil has convinced them of what they wanted to hear, that they can live however they want to, they can do whatever they want to do to whomever they want to do it, and there will be no consequences involved when it's all said and done. That's one of his best tools. And it's all in the mind. And then verse 4, The serpent said unto the woman, You shall not surely die. Verse 5, For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Now he's teaching her a false doctrine. A mystery doctrine that God never said. God doesn't even have it as an intention. And you cannot, you cannot disobey God and expect to have eternal life. Say amen. You cannot live in disobedience to God and expect to have eternal life. But that's what he tells people. That it's going to be okay. God just doesn't want you to know this. There's a secret. Well, I'm going to tell you the secret. So the Bible says now in verse 6, verse 6 is all about the operation of Eve's mind once the devil has done his job. I mean, all he said was these three things and then he shut up. He tempted her. He drew her mind over to it. He gave her these false ideas about what would happen if she actually ate of the fruit. And now he left it up to her. And so in verse 6 says, And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food. When you go shopping and you're going through the uh, fruits and vegetables, you look at those vegetables. My wife picks them, each one of them up. She looks at the tomatoes. She looks at the, the peppers. She thumps the watermelon or whatever it is. We look at those things and then we make a decision in our mind. We weigh it out in our mind and we make a decision in our mind. This is going to be good for my recipe. This is going to be good to eat. This is something we like. And so I'm going to purchase it. And that's exactly what Eve did. It all took place in her mind and the devil is the one who initiated that. But again, he never said, eat the fruit. Then, she, uh, and that it was pleasant to the eyes. Well, where do the eyes feed into? Mind. We don't take yummy pizza and rub it in our eyes, do we? And say, boy, that was good. I can't, oh, I want to eat another one of those. When it's pleasant to the eyes, it means our eyes saw it and our mind decided that it was good. Amen? So, if by chance the devil ever tempts me with a bowl of tripe, you know what tripe is? Tripe is something that I will never eat again. It tastes way too much like cow manure. Yep. A guy asked me, you want to try it? Okay, I'll try anything once. Yo, why are you trying that again? So if you were to ask me, oh, here's a bowl of tripe now, boy, you know you want it. No, I don't. No, I don't. I don't want it. So in my mind, I already know what it tastes like. I'm not ever going to eat it again. If I was starving to death, maybe. But other than that, I'm not eating it. So the devil then will offer me something that's pleasant to my eyes. And that's my mind that has likes and dislikes. Right? And then... A tree desired to make one wise. That's called the pride of life. This is lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and pride of life. Now it's desired to make one wise. Now she's saying, if I ate of this, I will have the knowledge of the gods. I'll live forever. What she's doing is that she's weighing out in her mind, believing what the devil told her about it, and she now believes that if she eats this fruit, 
She's going to be enlightened. She's going to have a knowledge that is superior to the knowledge that she has now. And, and she wants that. And all of this takes place in her mind. Once she made the decision to eat this fruit, what is there left to do? Eat the fruit. And she ate it. She immediately offered it to her husband, Adam. And he ate it. And the rest is you and I having to deal with decisions whether to sin or not to sin. And we face that decision sometimes every single day. It's all done in the mind. Then, 2 Corinthians 11 tells us that what Eve went through is something that's teachable. It's something that can be taught now as a doctrine and as a warning because the way that the devil tempted Eve is exactly the way the devil will corrupt your mind. Let me ask let me ask you a question. Those of you who are adults, has the devil at any time in your life ever corrupted your mind into thinking a way that is contrary to the Word of God? Some of you didn't say yes. Some of you said, oh, yes. We'll have to examine these people later. Okay? But that's what happens. Outward influences corrupt our minds. Things that people say, things that people teach, whether it's a preacher, whether it's a, a YouTube, social, social media, what do they call them? Influencer. A podcast, a song, um, a movie, a TV show, a commercial. All of those are designed by somebody to influence your mind to make a certain decision. Hamburger commercials, food commercials, beer commercials, all of them, uh, it's... It was, it's known now that tobacco companies back in the 50s and 60s marketed cigarettes directly to women telling, by giving them the idea that they would be like going against the flow. They would be pushing the barrier, that they could be liberated women because back then, back years ago, women didn't smoke cigarettes. Only men smoked them. Men that would have been in the army, that fought on Iwo Jima, they smoked cigarettes. But women didn't smoke cigarettes. But then the tobacco companies, they got smart. They started, um, they started owning television shows. Some of the early game shows that were put on TV had a little dancing Chesterfield box that came out during an intermission. Did a little tap dance. This game show is brought to you by Chesterfield. They're healthy. And that's what people were told. Do what? Doctors recommend smoking camels. Okay? No filters. I have a magazine. Somebody sent me some old magazines. Life magazines. And this was from uh, sometime in the 60s. And what was happening was doctors for the very first time were starting to allow men into the delivery room with their wives. Now, you had all these doctors screaming against that because they were saying, number one, the sight of that happening will drive men away from their wives and they won't have anything to do with them ever again. Then they said, 
It's unsanitary to have a man in there. Now, the pictures of this are, I'm not kidding you, the doctor, the husband, the wife in the uh, labor room all smoking cigarettes before she gives birth. <sighs> okay, now push. And they're calling the man unsanitary. <sighs> Crazy. But they convinced people that it was good to smoke, it was healthy to smoke, women, you ought to smoke. And so they own TV shows, they own game shows, they, they were everywhere. It convinced them to do it. Look at 2 Corinthians 11, verse 1. Would to God you could bear with me a little of my folly and indeed bear with me, for I'm jealous over you with a godly jealousy. For I've espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. That's the Apostle Paul's job. That, to some degree, is my job. To try to give you enough knowledge of the Word of God that will purify your soul, not your flesh, but will purify your soul so that you are presented as a chaste bride for Jesus Christ. So it's the reason why I have to preach certain things. Because... That's part, of, that's part of what's in here. So he says, verse 3, But I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety. So right here, Paul is saying how the devil did it to Eve is how he'll do it to you and how he do it to your children. I made the comment to Lisa here a while back. Michaela's the oldest of my grandkids and I am lamenting the day that my grandchildren as cute and innocent as they are one of these days I know they're going to lose that innocence and I'm not going to like that I know it happens. I know it happened to me. It happens to all children. They grow up. They learn things about this world and about human behavior. And they lose their innocence. It's better off if they just don't grow up. Amen? But it has to happen. Because I know that the devil is already trying to corrupt their minds. Let's take the children that are alive now. Our children, your neighbor's children, family member's children. Right now, what is the number one influence in practically every child in America right now. They're tablets. They're tablets. They're Xbox. Social media. YouTube. They're going to find out one of these days that there's more than just YouTube. Parents, get involved while you can and get a filter. Put on that tablet or that phone. There's several of them out there. I'm not going to tell you which one to choose. But I would know, if I were you, I would know everything that your kid does on that thing. I would know a guy just called me the other day. And I can't remember if it was his family or somebody in his family. He said they just did catch, just in time, their teenage daughter who was about 
to be abducted because they saw her sitting over in the corner, 14 years old, texting somebody and they didn't know who it was. And come to find out it was an older man who was texting them to try to get them to meet up with them. I would know who's corrupting your child. Okay? So, let's keep reading it. Verse 3. But I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. That warning goes to children and it goes to us adults too. Um, I wasn't really looking for this, but I, I looked at my YouTube page and I wanted to see uh, what my top videos were. The top number one video on YouTube, uh, something I did several years ago, was about the Hebrew Roots movement. People telling people that they have to keep the law to be saved, that they have to do the feast days to be saved, that they can't eat pork. If you eat pork, you're not saved. And all these things that you must... In other words, they have to go back and follow the Mount Sinai law in order to be saved. But that's not how you're saved. You're saved by grace through faith and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God. It is not of works, lest any man should boast. And that's it. Amen? Okay? And that video was the number one video watched. They had like 30,000 views on it. And I'm like, whoa! You know what happens? People decide that they're going to follow Christ. They decide that they're going to get maybe in a church or they're going to follow an online ministry. And invariably, somebody intervenes somehow, some way through emails or through a, a suggestion by YouTube or somebody says, hey, have you seen this video? Boy, you need to watch this because... I tell you, a lot of churches are, are wrong right now. Oh, really? Well, that just feeds into conspiracy people's minds. Oh, yeah, a lot of churches are wrong. I want to find out what's wrong with them. And they end up watching something that tells them that they have, that the, all the churches won't preach it because they're too scared, that they have to go back and keep the law. And I've seen people leave and go do that. One of them went to church here, preached here and ended up trying to start a Hebrew roots Sabbath keeping church down south after them knowing the truth somebody influenced them and corrupt their minds from the simplicity that is in Christ so they no longer believe that you're saved only by grace through faith you're saved by grace and after you do as much of the law as you can which is a lie uh, but anyway, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he cometh that preacheth another Jesus whom we have not preached, or if you receive another spirit which you have not received, or another gospel which you have not accepted, you might well bear with him. So the corruption that happens is in order to draw you away from the real Christ to a counterfeit, from the real spirit of God to mystery Babylon, and then from the real gospel to a False gospel of works. Now, turn to Ephesians 6. It's not just the devil. And believe me, I'm only going to give you about 20% of this message this morning. So, you ought to be thankful. 20%. By next Sunday, more than likely... What I have given you today will end up being like 10%. Because I'll add to it. Ephesians 6, 11, Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. The wiles of the devil are how he tricks us in our mind. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities. Principalities are princes. Devils. The prince of the people of Persia. Uh, Gog. The chief Prince of Magog. Those are devils. They are principality devils. Uh, those principalities are intended to draw in our minds us away from being under the authority of the word of God to the authority of some evil spirit against powers, 
same, pretty much the same idea that draws away from being under the power and influence of the Holy Spirit to the power and influence of a devil. Rulers of the darkness of this world. Instead of your mind being enlightened by thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path, now the God of this world darkens your eyes, has blinded you, and your mind now is dark and you have a spirit that rules over you because now you're walking in darkness and you're walking in the darkness of this world. And then spiritual wickedness in high places. Where in relation to your body is your mind? It's in a high place, isn't it? And the wickedness that your body performs starts in the high place of the mind. Four types of devils that are constantly going to work on you. Now, Proverbs, I'm almost done. Proverbs 2. So we have the devil who is your tempter. He works on your mind. We have all the devils, part of his kingdom, a third of the angelic realm, that are there to tempt you, to draw you away, to pressure you, to oppress you, uh, and so on and so on, until you crack, until you give, uh, or you, you make them leave. And then we have her. Her. She has many names. Mystery Babylon the Great. Diana, the goddess. Ashtaroth, goddess of the Old Testament. Kamala. She's, yeah. She also shows up in human form. But there's a spirit there. Proverbs chapter 2, verse 16. Proverbs, Solomon is telling his son, pay attention to my words because my words will deliver thee from the strange woman. Even from the stranger with flatter, which flattereth with her words. She doesn't kidnap people and force them. She just tells them what they want to hear. How many churches are like that? Flattereth with her words, which forsaketh the guide of her youth, and forgetteth the covenant of her God. So she's forgotten salvation by grace through faith. For her house inclineth unto death, and her paths unto the dead. Where does she intend to lead you? Hell. None that go unto her return again. Neither take they hold of the paths of life. So let me, let me just say this very quickly. If you're able to go through life and never cheat, on your wife or your husband. That's good. That means you're not an adulterer. But. Things happen. You could be sitting here. Um, people online. If you commit adultery once. Is there any way to undo that? No, you're an adulterer. That's none that go under her again. None that go under her return again. There's no way to go back and not be an adulterer. People commit sins. And when it's all done, they say, why did I do this? That show, To Catch a Predator. Remember that? Um, Chris Hansen working with police, catching these pedophiles that were trying to hook up with teenage girls or boys. Once they go into the house and Chris Hansen comes out, they already know the jig is up. And many of them say, why did I do this? Why did I do this? Because it can't be undone. You can't go back 
and make it not happen anymore. It's over with. You did it. Look at Proverbs chapter 5, verse 3. For the lips of a strange woman drop as in honeycomb, and her mouth is smoother than oil, but her end is bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two-edged sword. Her feet go down to death. Her steps take hold on hell. Lest thou shouldest ponder the... See, what you know what pondering is? It's the mind. The mind... You're sitting in church today to ponder the path of life. The path of life is the gospel and the word of God. Amen? This Bible will lead you to everlasting life. And so we are here today not to do, but to learn. To learn how to think in a different way. It's my job, first of all, for me to get in this book and have this book change the way I think. Then it's my responsibility to stand before you to draw your attention to the Word of God so that the Word of God changes how we think so that we are spending our time pondering the path of life rather than pondering ways that we can commit sin and get away with it. So... Uh, her end is bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two-edged sword. Verse 6, lest thou shouldest ponder the path of life, her ways are movable, that thou canst not know them. Hear me now, therefore, O ye children, and depart not from the words of my mouth. Remove thy way far from her, and come not nigh the door of her house. In other words, don't even go there. Don't even walk down the street where she lives. Don't go to the neighborhood if she's on one side of town, you stay on the other side of town. You stay away from her. In every area of life, you stay away from her. If you know that there's certain websites that have, uh, let's say, questionable content, don't go to them. Don't visit them. Videos that have questionable content, don't watch them. Not just sleazy, dirty stuff. I'm talking false doctrine stuff. I'm talking uh, women preachers. Don't listen to them. Now, Proverbs 7, turn there and I'll close. That's what you were waiting to hear. Oh, he's almost done. He's 30 minutes away. Gone to home stretch, going right down to the wire now. Proverbs 7, verse 6. Listen to how Solomon describes this woman. For at the window of my house, I looked through my casement and beheld among the simple ones, I discerned among the youths, a young man, void of understanding. Understanding is in the mind. Passing through the street near her corner. Why do you think he was passing through the street near her corner? He knew she was standing out there. He knew where she lived. He knew where he could hook up. Used to be hard. Back in the old days before we had phones. I wonder how many church members, I didn't say Christians, how many church members have some kind of app on their phone that lets them hook up. See, the apps made it easy. The apps, basically, they figure out where you are. And then there's some woman or man that lives within driving distance of you. And they have notified the app that they're looking. You've notified the app that you're looking. And the app says, this person here, you don't even have to ask them. You don't have to risk getting caught. You don't have to risk being turned down. They're looking. And so it's made it easy for men and women both.
to commit adultery. It's made it easy for men to maintain a closet sodomite lifestyle or a wife the same way. And kids are using it now. Kids are using it. That's the shame of it. So, passing through the street near her corner, he went to the way, the way to her house. Verse 9, in the twilight, in the evening, in the black and dark night. And behold, there met him a woman with the attire of a harlot, subtle of heart. She is loud and stubborn. Her feet abide not in her house. Now is she without, now in the streets, and lieth in wait at every corner. So she caught him and kissed him. And with an impudent face said unto him, I have peace offerings with me. This day have I paid my vows. In other words, I went to the priest already. And the priest already forgave me of what I'm about to do because I paid him money for an indulgence that's still done. I have peace offerings and um, I have decked my bed with coverings of tapestry and carved works and with fine linen of Egypt. And I have performed my, or perfumed, performed my bed, perfumed my bed with myrrh, aloes, and cinnamon. Come, let us... That just makes me want to eat the sheets. <laughs> Sounds good, amen. Come, let us take our fill of love until the morning. Let us solace ourselves with loves. For the good man is not at home. You know what that's saying? You won't get caught. You can do this and nobody will know. Oh, yeah, that's what I've been waiting to hear. The good man is not at home. He is a long, gone a long journey. He hath taken a bag of money with him and will come home at the day appointed. With her much fair speech, she caused him to yield. With the flattering of her lips, she forced him. He goeth after her straight away as an ox goeth to the slaughter. Or as a fool to the correction of the stocks. Till a dart strike through his liver as a bird hasteth to the snare. And knoweth not that it is for his life. In other words, you know what the woman did? She removed in his mind any barrier or obstacle that would have stopped him from being in bed with her. You won't get caught. I've already approved it with God. I've got the bed made. Got perfumes everywhere. Uh, scent is a very strong attractant. I've got it perfumed. I've got and my husband won't be home. We're not going to get caught. I won't tell your wife. Let's go. All of these work on the barriers that we have in our mind. See, it's one thing if a woman looks at a man, kind of gives him the eye, and he sees that maybe she's interested in me. But that man's got barriers now. He's married. He's, uh, he's got to be home. His wife's going to wonder where he is or, or any number of things. But if she can succeed in removing all those barriers, it's over. My advice to you, and we'll get into this as we move along, fortify your mind. Understand that maybe your wife won't know about it, or your husband won't know about it, or your mom and dad won't know about it. God does. God will see it. God will expose it. And you'll wish you had never done that. But it's too late. You already did it. You already did it. 